let's come together now and confess our sin before God. Because scripture tells us that the Lord is our shepherd in the 23rd Psalm, and therefore we shall not want and be afraid. But sadly, we know there's still many things that we covet, that we, that we desire, and we also know there's many times we cower in fear. So let's just confess um, this sad truth to God together now. Shepherd Lord, we do not always like being led, and we don't want to be told where and when to lie down to rest. We avoid difficult valleys and believe we are all alone. We avoid sitting with enemies and refuse to obey your commandments. Have mercy on us as we contemplate our sinful nature. Hear the good news. Because of the gracious forgiveness found in our Lord Jesus Christ, surely we, surely goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our lives and we'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We are forgiven. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 5 to 12. Hear God's word. The next day, their rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. When they had made the prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, If we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who was sick and are asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. It has become the cornerstone. There is no salvation, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. Spirit, write these words on our hearts and minds and speak to us so that we can know how to apply your ancient word to our daily lives. Amen. Well, it might seem odd to you that we are, Nick and I are um, preaching out of Acts because we haven't even gotten to uh, the Ascension, which comes on May 16th, or Pentecost, which comes on May 23rd. But after Easter, the, the book of Acts replaces the Old Testament reading in the lectionary. So I just want to offer that to you so you don't get confused why we are, where we are, uh, preaching, you know, on what we're preaching on. Because this is kind of an interesting time of year when Acts comes up, and there's a good reason, and I hope you'll see why. So the scripture starts the next day. So what's, what's happened? So it's been 40 days since... Christ's resurrection, when he um, appears to the disciples and says to them, you will be my witnesses. And that's what Reverend um, Ashley preached on last week. Then the, uh, the Holy Spirit, as promised, has fallen on them in such a fashion that 
um, the people around them think they're having a party, that they're drunk. And now they're living, all the disciples are living together in, in this kind of heaven on earth fellowship where they're sharing everything. And the most remarkable thing uh, about this passage is who, who, who is this Peter? Who is this Peter who is, um, is um, bold and confident and um, clear and um, who is telling them, telling these religious leaders who before he was, he was cowering before them, he couldn't even stand up to a little girl after Jesus was arrested. Peter is preaching that we are all witnesses to the fact of the resurrection and the ascension of this Jesus and to the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so repent and be baptized. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And even though he's getting in trouble with the powerful people, this message is resonating with the regular people. So much so that um, the number of those who believed at this point, the story tells us, is around 5,000. But the problem is that he and John are getting in trouble with these religious leader, leaders, particularly the Sadducees, because they do not preach resurrection from the dead. And so they're very upset, and they have imprisoned Peter and John. Now, this would have been a, a terrifying situation because... Basically, the, this, um, um, these, these priests, they're sort of like the Supreme Court. They, um, they're in there for life. And then they, their family members would come in and become priests after them. And so you had this kind of like high priestly class of people that were in power. And so they're bringing Peter and John into their midst now and really trying to intimidate them and asking them by what power or by what name did you heal this guy? Because Peter and John had come upon a lame man and had healed him in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And so um, obviously the, the powerful do not want this to happen. They don't want to share their power and uh, have the status quo change and they thought they had dealt with this Jesus and apparently they have not so what what might occur to you right off the bat is this dramatic change I I was really struck by it because the disciples that we just left behind in Luke um, they are for the three years that they were following Jesus they uh, didn't understand what Jesus was talking about. They did understand and then they forgot. They doubted what Jesus told them. They competed with each other for who was going to be more powerful and who was going to sit next to Jesus in heaven. Their, um, their faith often failed. When they tried to heal sometimes, it didn't work. And um, instead of allowing everybody to come to Jesus, for instance, they wouldn't let the children come. So they really are not a very impressive group. And of course, at the end, when push came to shove, they betrayed Jesus. They abandoned Jesus and, and let him go alone to the cross. This Peter, and also the other disciples, but we're going to use Peter as an example, is what I call Disciples 2.0. Something has happened to, to, to update them from this kind of sad disciple 1.0 that we left in the Gospels. Well, what has happened to them so that they can stand up, no longer in fear, stand up to the religious leaders, uh, do miracles of healing, live in an alternative way, and um, preach with great power, is the, the Holy Spirit. I call it the Holy Spirit update. Um, it's kind of like on your, um, your phone or your iPad when you've set up automatic updates. And somehow when Jesus left, he must have set it up in the disciples because they received this update without even asking. And, and they're transformed. The, the, the scripture in Acts tells us that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. This word filled is a very unusual one in Greek and it's um, it's in a sense almost like possessed. 
they, um, and he's not alone. The other disciples have also experienced this transformation. At Pentecost, there were around 120 of them, men and women. And it, this, this, um, the spirit fell on them all in this kind of cataclysmic way. And clearly they're all transformed. And so they've been empowered to, to, um, to do miraculous things and live in a miraculous way. Very, very different, startlingly different from our disciples 1.0. And so now Peter is standing up and um, after they've been released from prison, he and John are standing there in front of the religious leaders and they, and they, they say, um, you know, we're going we're gonna to keep doing this and we're doing it in the name of Jesus Christ. And, and they pray after they're released, after this interview with the powerful leaders, they continue to pray, God, enable us to speak your word with great boldness. Um, we know, Lord, that you're the, all these leaders did what your power and your will decided beforehand. And so it, the scripture tells us in Acts that the place was shaken. And everybody was filled with Holy Spirit again, and they boldly spoke the word of God. So to me, this is kind of an interesting distinction, even though the disciples kind of received this update that transformed them from Disciples 1.0 to Disciples 2.0, they do then, it doesn't appear like these, these, um, uh, these updates are automatic after that, that they have to meet together, they have to pray and praise and ask for the Holy Spirit, which again, comes but now they're asking for it they know that they need it and so they are filled with the holy spirit this started having me kind of consider well what were the what were the disciples 1.0 filled with well a lot of the times they were filled with anxiety and and i think if we're honest with ourselves most of us are filled with anxiety a lot of the time and interestingly enough, I found this um, podcast that Ezra Klein does. He was interviewing um, a professor named uh, Judson Brewer, and he heads up the Center for Mindfulness at Brown University. And he's done all these tests, and, and, and he's discovered that about um, in about 50% of our waking time, our conscious time, not asleep, that our minds are focused on either the past or the future, but we don't, we're not even usually conscious of it. Our mind, when kind of given freedom, wanders usually to either think about ourselves or to be anxious or sometimes both. And that makes me think that, you know, the disciples 1.0 were often filled with anxiety. They didn't know what Jesus was doing. They didn't know when he was going to complete his work. They didn't want him to die. And they were super anxious about their own future. As opposed to these disciples 2.0 who are not afraid of the religious leaders. They're not afraid to die. And they're, they're witnessing to the joy and the, and the, and the power of God living in, in, a, in an extraordinarily free way. They're living like the, there's a shepherd that God is a shepherd who's going to lead and guide and protect them. Like they really believe that. Because they're not filled with anxiety anymore. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. I think this really helps us understand when Jesus said to them, you will be my witnesses. And when Jesus says it to us, that being filled with the Holy Spirit is the crucial peace that we must attend to because we're going to be witnesses to whatever's really filling us. And people can usually see whether you're filled with joy and power and freedom or anxiety. So what kind of witnesses then do we want to be? Um, we know that in Scripture, one of God's Ten Commandments is do not bear false witness. And of course, the Derek Chauvin trial has been in the news dominating everything. Um, he, was, he was convicted 
of killing George Floyd. But and part of the crucial reason was be, because there were at least one powerful person who witnessed to the truth, um, who broke the blue wall that um, police usually maintain, um, that kind of maintains their power. And, and this is a, was a crucial turning point because this doesn't always happen. People don't always witness to the truth. And um, so I think that that's a powerful example for us about what happens when we witness to the truth even in the face of powerful reasons not to, powerful anxiety. Justice gets done. So I think this is a helpful um, word for us today in considering what kind of witnesses that we want to be in our world today. Because we, we weren't there when Jesus died and was resurrected and ascended, but we, we are, um, we're, we're still continuing to preach that good news. But in doing so, we become witnesses on our own. And so what do we become witnesses to? Well, we become witnesses to God's power and God's faithfulness. And we aren't just witnesses on our own. We become, as the church of Jesus Christ, a powerful witness in the world. Because the world needs truthful fearless witnesses to what God has done in Jesus Christ and what God is still doing. And the church that was born on Pentecost has become a witness to this. I had a professor in seminary, Beverly Gaventa, Dr. Beverly Gaventa, and she says of the book of Acts that the that acts might remind the church, especially in times of malaise or crisis, that it does not belong to itself, but to the God of Israel, the God who raised Jesus from the dead, and the God whose witness continues within, outside, and even in spite of the church. Because the church can often be like the church 1.0, living in fear and anxiety, and the church needs that update of the Holy Spirit to become the church 2.0 in the world today. Peter goes on to tell the religious leaders, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. And I thought, you know, salvation's not just some hope of a future with God or not just freedom from past sins. Salvation, the gift of salvation is to be able to live abundant freedom, free, lives of freedom now, like these disciples are in Acts. Salvation is to live with the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Where do you see that in the world? These 2.0 disciples are witnessing to a fruitless, anxiety-filled world. But they're also witnessing to one another and we need to do that too. We know we need to witness to the outside world, but we need to witness to one another. And I thought, maybe you're having some anxiety about a loved one. Maybe you or someone you know, someone you love, needs almost a miraculous healing and you're wondering, could God really do that? Does God really care? Well, like Peter did, our church wants to pray, Lord, stretch out your hand to heal and perform miracles and wonders 
through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Our church wants to witness to the power and love of God to miraculously heal through the power of the Holy Spirit. Our church wants to witness that death does not have the final word. And we want to witness to God as a shepherd who restores our souls and walks with us throughout our lives, every step of the way, even through the valley. As we go on our way to become disciples, 3.0. Oh Lord, loving God, help us to be the kind of witnesses you had in mind. And help us never to do it apart from the power of the Holy Spirit, which you have so generously poured out on us. And we pray today that people who are anxious and feeling hopeless will turn to you and receive a miraculous touch of your love and your grace. Amen. So now, having been given so much from God, it's our time to give back. Give um, toward the work that God is doing building the kingdom of heaven here and now through us. So please give generously, particularly to the food offering.